Yeah. Hey folks, happy garbage day. It's Tuesday. Although we had a crazy thing happen at our house this morning. We almost missed garbage day. I know, of all the importance that I place on this, you would think. But I was pulling out of my driveway to take my kid to school and the garbage truck was coming down the street and I looked at the corner and the garbage wasn't there. I was like, ah! So you gotta get out the car to make a mad dash into the garage, get the, the thing while the tr garbage truck is looking at me like, really? <laughs> Sorry, thank you. So, happy garbage day. A happy ending for all of us. Happy almost spring break. Almost. I know this is the point where we're all summoning like whatever reserves that are empty to try and like make it through there. And I feel you, I hear you. And I gotta remind you, I'm contractually obligated to be here and keep talking. So I understand where we're at, and I'm going to try and make this uh, the best we can. So does anyone have uh, writing that they need to be working on, like master's thesis or research publications or things like that? Okay, good news. You don't have to do that because I've released another homework. So you can be productive and yet put off the things that are more challenging and amorphous. So I have in the next homework, what are we at, three? Does that sound right? Uh, homework three is available and is due like the week after spring break, so you have plenty of time to work on it. I also opened up your next formative assessment, which is due the Monday after spring break. So I don't normally make things due on that Monday, but since these shouldn't take a whole lot of time, I figured that would be fair. You can get it done this week after we finish talking about this stuff. So those things are available for you. We have the formative assessment that closed yesterday to go over. So I looked at those answers this morning. I saw a couple of points of, of confusion that were common that I want to talk about, but for the most part, I think folks were able to answer these questions reasonably well, but we'll go over them nonetheless. So the first question was, what kind of conditional distribution is most appropriate for each type of categorical outcome, binary, ordinal, or nominal? So these specific names are variants of a more general idea of categorical data, as it's known. The idea is that even though we might have numbers in a database that correspond to one is this and two is this, they're not really numbers and we can't treat them that way. So if I have a binary variable, what kind of distribution matches that? Also starts with the B. Bernoulli, yeah. Bernoulli distribution has one parameter in it, the probability of a one. It does not have a separate estimated variance. So a few of you commented about that. The idea of not having a variance is not that we're saying the prediction is perfect. We're not saying that. What we're saying is that we don't need a separate number to be figured out as to what the variability around the predicted outcomes should be. The variability around a predicted outcome is the probability of a one times the probability of a zero at that point. And it's non-constant. So it stretches as we get closer to 0.5, it'll be the most, and then it shrinks as you move away. So there is variance in a Bernoulli distribution. It's just that we know what it is if we know what the mean is. How about ordinal or nominal? Do these need different distributions or not? So this is a point of confusion because some of you started talking about cumulative versus baseline logits. Does that answer the question about distributions? No, what is logit? That's a link function. So there's three pieces to a generalized model. There's the linear predictor, which is what, what slopes you want in the model, the same, they work the same as always. There's the conditional distribution, which is what, does the, what do the residuals look like, basically, after we're done predicting them. And then there's the link function, which is how we create an unbounded outcome for the model to predict that when we back translate it, keeps the predicted outcomes within the sample space they're supposed to have. So this question is not about logits. This question is about distributions. So if it's ordinal or nominal, what kind of distribution do I need for that? Multinomial. Multinomial. And, and it's not different. Because the way that you differentiate whether an outcome is being treated as ordinal or nominal is with the link function, not the distribution. Bernoulli, you can think of as a special case of multinomial in which there's only two choices. Multinomial has more than two choices. You can also think of Bernoulli as a special case of something called binomial, 
which is when you have multiple trials. So I guarantee you would have seen a binomial like talking about coin flips or some shit like that back in intro stat, you know, like pulling marbles out of a bag or flipping a coin, like when you do something repeatedly. How often are you going to have like five, you know, heads out of ten, that kind of thing? That's, that's binomial. A Bernoulli is if you only had one shot, one trial, then it's just a special case. So you can think of Bernoulli and binomial as related. You can think of by Bernoulli and multinomial as related as well. And the good news at this stage, which is no longer true after these models, is that we can't really be wrong. Like these are the only choices and we don't have to worry about how well they fit. Any kind of outcome that's a number, like where we're talking about counts, we'll be talking about continuous outcomes, then we have the chance of being wrong. But for categorical, we just need as many categories as we have. Okay, any thoughts or questions on that one? Okay, so then the rest of this conversation is about how the logits and the link function then differentiate the outcomes to be predicted. So intercepts and thresholds. So if I have a binary submodel, something's got to be the zero and something's got to be the one. I'm being deliberately vague because these concepts apply regardless of whether you're talking about a nominal model or an ordinal model. What does an intercept tell us? Let's say if I'm, I'm using a logit link, what's an intercept tell me? The logit of the probability of the IR category. Yes, the logit of the probability of the one, I'm putting air quotes around that. So the, whatever the model is predicting, the higher category if it's ordinal, the non-reference outcome if it's nominal, the one though. So what's a threshold then? The probability of a zero instead. Yeah, the logit for the probability of a zero instead. So if I want to go back and forth between these two things, how do I do that? How do intercepts and thresholds relate to each other mathematically? Additive inverse was the technical term. What would a non-math person say that is? Multiply by minus one. Multiply by minus one. Yeah, I didn't know the term additive inverse. But I asked someone, and they're like, yeah, that's what it would be called. But multiply by minus one. The reason why you can do it that way is because logits are symmetric. That's why. So if I know the probability of a one is 0.9, that corresponds to a logit of 2.2. That means the opposite, like the probability of a zero instead of a one, corresponds to a logit of negative 2.2. So a threshold is what we call the constant if, you're, if it is giving you the logit of the probability of the lower category of the zero. We call it an intercept if it's giving you the probability of a one instead. Several of you commented on this slide right here where the term threshold was introduced. So I want to clarify that this conceptualization of Y star is related to thresholds, but intercepts could also be used in this spot. So Y star is the idea of the pretend underlying continuous variable that gave rise to the binary version. I didn't share my screen, did I? Goodness gracious. Thank you, Zoomers. You would think. I remember from my first class, but by the time I get here, I forget I'm no longer sharing. But I'm on, I just opened up slide 14 out of lecture two, because several of you commented about this slide. So Y star, if you have this idea of this continuous variable that gave rise to your binary or your ordinal response, Y star has an E to it, because Y star can have a variance. But we don't know, we, we, not, we will never have Y star. Like, that's an imaginary concept. So it doesn't matter if we say Y star is distributed logistically or normally, because there's no way of disproving either of those things. Where the idea of a threshold comes from is that it's the point, this is slide 16, it's the point where the division happens to create your binary outcome. So like this one would be equidistant if, if in this case, so we would say the threshold is at zero. But if we wanted to have a distribution where there were more ones, the threshold would be moved to the left and the point on this continuum where the split happens 
corresponds to the logit of the probability of a zero. So that's where, that's where this alternative way of thinking about the same thing comes from in terms of thresholds. But the Y star equation is, note the minus sign is right here. Like, you can turn this into an intercept instead. So the way that I think is probably the easiest to keep track of is what is the term telling you? Is it corresponding to the probability of a one or is it corresponding to the probability of a zero? And different software will do that differently, which is why it's important to know what you have. If you are in a software package that is giving you thresholds, the slopes are still predicting the one instead. The model is disjointed in its direction. The threshold predicts the zero, the slopes will predict the one. And that's yet another reason why I hate thresholds. So the thing to hang on to, I think, is this concept, the symmetry of the logit scale. If you know what the logit is for one of the probabilities, you know what the logit is for the other, because times minus one is how we get back and forth. OK, does that help clear that up a little bit, maybe? Yeah, don't worry about the continuous underlying variable thing. Like, that's just a trick. Like, it's just a motivating idea for how to create a scale for these things. We don't ever have that information. The good news is that after this point, after we get out of categorical data, it's all intercepts. Because then we're back to predicting numbers. So it works out much better. All right, then we get into ordinal versus nominal. What is the difference between cumulative and baseline category, otherwise known as generalized logit link functions? We can start with what are they for? Which one is for ordinal? Cumulative or baseline category? Cumulative. Yeah. Cumulative goes with ordinal. That means baseline category goes with nominal. What's the difference between ordinal and nominal? Yeah, nominal is unordered. Unordered and nominal mean the same thing. So in terms of how the model differentiates it, yeah, the numbers mean something. Good. In terms of how the model differentiates it, how is a cumulative logit, how do they build the submodels that make it ordinal? Go ahead. They're always comparing one submodel, oh, or okay. all the submodels. So if I have, uh, like, if I have five categories, how many submodels do I need? We need four. Does that change if I'm talking about ordinal or nominal? No. I, I will get back to five probabilities with four submodels. The only question is how they divide it up. Uh, so in a cumulative submodel. All of the choices are in every submodel. So if I had five, it would go one versus two, three, four. One versus two, three, four, five, excuse me. One, two versus three, four, five. One, two, three versus four, five. One, two, three, four versus five. So every answer choice is in every model. That enforces this ordering, that the intercepts have to stay in order or the thresholds have to stay in order across the categories. Um, also, the zoomers mentioned in cumulative logit link models, by default, the slopes are constrained equal across submodels. That's what's known as a proportional odds assumption. And it's testable, as we discovered. If you have enough data, I should say it's testable. Baseline category, then, how does that link function work instead? Go for it. So that's if you have like whatever your reference is versus um, like these other submodels. So it's like the reference is like one or like the letter closer to zero or something mm -hmm. versus like two versus three versus four. Yep. Yeah, so the baseline category is dummy coding your outcome conceptually. You pick one category answer as your reference. Let's say it's one. And your submodels will go one versus two, one versus three, one versus four, 
1 versus 5. And the higher in that context would be the alternative. Like what does it take to move off of the reference? So it's directly analogous to the idea of if I have a categorical predictor with five categories, how many dummy codes do I need in my model? I need four. So I need four submodels for the same reasons because then I can put everything back together again. If I can figure out the probability of four of the five categories, I know what the fifth one has to be because they have to sum to one. So within baseline category for nominal, then not all answer choices are used in every submodel. It's focusing on just the two that are the, the point of that submodel. So it takes a little bit of math to work back to what the marginal probability would be. Then you get things like of the people who answered one or two, 60% answered two. You get those sorts of conditional probabilities out of that. Yes, reference group versus C and C minus one submodels, exactly. So if I have an ordinal outcome, going to the next question then, could I use a nominal model for it if I want to? If I have an ordinal outcome, could I fit a baseline category link function yeah. as if it were nominal? Sure I could. When would that make sense? When might one want to do that, even if they have an ordinal outcome? Say it louder. Yeah, if, if you're really interested in like what it takes to make a choice of this versus something else, like there's some research suggesting whether or not like neutral as a choice should be an actual choice or whether that's bad. If you wanted to uh, compare like what does it take to move off of neutral, then a nominal model could do that potentially. Uh, significantly better or not when estimating more parameters. Yes, that's another thing to consider. Nominal models default to having all the slopes separate. So every submodel has a different set of slopes and a different intercept, whereas the ordinal models tend to have the same slopes unless you relax that constraint. Um, could I take a nominal outcome and fit a cumulative logit model to it? Could I fit an ordinal model to a nominal outcome? Could I or should I are different questions, okay, right? Yeah. Could I? You can, but you shouldn't. I could. Stop or I'll be like, cool. No, now, why shouldn't I? Why shouldn't I fit an ordinal model to a nominal outcome? Because the comparison of the higher category does not really make sense. Because there is no higher category. Yeah, there is no higher category. The submodels wouldn't make any sense. Because, like, the idea of 1 versus 2, 3, 4, it only makes sense to think about a score greater than 1 if there is a greater or lesser to the comparison. Otherwise, it's just I pick this one instead of that one, and there's not an ordering to it. So I do think nominal can be used in pretty much any case. Ordinal should only be used in ordinal. Uh, what if I just said, uh, can I just pretend like it's, it's a number? Like if I have an ordinal scale that has 10 possibilities, could I pretend that's a number? I could. What might happen though? Two problems. What could happen if I take an ordinal outcome and I pretend like it's uh, an interval scale? Fit a general, general model to it with a normal distribution. You have a sum that doesn't make sense, like one point something or that. Say that again? I said you have a specific outcome that doesn't make sense, like one point something, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, so the model will come back with predictions that are not just potentially out of bounds, like it might predict an 11 for my 10 point scale, but also in between, right? Like I will come up with like a predicted score of 7.6. It's like I can't have that. That's not a choice. I can only have a 7 or an 8. So the, the ordinal model generates the probability of each response category as a discrete option because that is what they are. So you, you really have to be comfortable with the idea that these are like, like you have to believe that it's secretly a number to treat it like one. 
But what about standard errors? Those are probably going to be an issue as well because we don't have one constant variance that would fit. The variance is going to shrink as you get closer to the boundary points. So those would be the two issues in treating something that's ordinal as if it were interval. And it matters more, the more skewed the distribution is and the fewer the categories you have. You will see this a lot in literature looking at factor analysis and structural equation modeling which is a lot easier and faster to do if you're willing to pretend that ordinal data are numbers. So there's a whole line of research on how many categories is enough to where I can pretend that it's a number. And the answer is somewhere between five and seven, but it depends on how skewed it is. If it's symmetric, five to seven might be okay to pretend like it's an interval and not go out of bounds. But the more skewed it is, the bigger a problem it would be. Same would be true in this context as well. All right. I think that was all the questions. Anything I'm forgetting or that you wanted to ask about? So you'll get a chance to practice these ideas in your homework three that has just been opened. There are no interaction terms, none. There's only two slopes and they're just regular slopes. And I know that you know what a slope is. And so most of the questions are going to be asking you, what is the slope predicting? What is the Y of this submodel? That's where the tricky part comes in. So the questions are worded somewhat backwards relative to what you may have seen before, focusing on the interpretation of what the submodel is designed to tell you, not just the role of the slope in that submodel. The, uh, the homework three is based on yet another story problem from real life. It is the study at Midwestern State University, as all of my fake studies are conducted. Uh, parents who are trying to decide where to send their child to kindergarten. And the, the interest and the effect of parents' income and need for after-school care in moderating those choices. So autobiographical story. We ended up keeping our son in the Montessori school, not just because it was a nice school, but because they had after-school child care that was guaranteed. <laughs> and parents who have full-time jobs value such things. So, Speaking of which, happy eighth birthday to my son. If he ever listens to my YouTube video, he's turning eight years old today. I sent him to school with a big box of donuts. Glazed donuts with vanilla frosting and sprinkles for days. So I apologize to the Montessori teachers who are going to have to clean up the sprinkles afterward. But... It's really not a good donut unless it's covered in sprinkles, from what I understand. So I personally do not like sprinkles. I'm offended by them because they're like these hard, crunchy little things that like ruin the texture of whatever soft food you're eating. Like donuts are soft. You know, ice cream is soft. And then it's like all of a sudden it's like crunch, like I broke a tooth. So no, sprinkles are not for me, but that's probably just because I'm old. All right. Ready for something new? So remember, I get foreshadowing last time. This is a, based on another true story. I did mess up the, the foreshadowing to some extent because I conflated this story with a different story that was uh, happening around the same time. But this is from a paper that was published in 2015. The lead author is Rosie Maldonado. She was a graduate student at the University of Nebraska. Her advisor, David DeLillo, and myself who advised in this project. Uh, the paper is inside the download folder that goes with this example so that you can see what that would look like in practice. And she was doing an experiment looking at the effects of emotion regulation strategy. So she was a clinical psychologist where the choices were none, cognitive reappraisal or suppression. Do we have any clinical people in here? Here? Yeah, do those words mean anything to you? Yeah, what, what does cognitive reappraisal mean? Rethink your thoughts. Reevaluate, like make them not piss you off as much, maybe? Or like reframe the situation yeah, to something kind of like sort of better? Correcting like the cognitive, like it's an idea of cognitive behavioral therapy of like reframing or correcting or like adjusting like the cognitive bias. Okay. So they're usually like automatic thoughts. 
So addressing a cognitive bias from cognitive behavioral therapy, what is suppression then? Because that sounds bad to me. I'm not either. I, that's why I'm asking for help here. But, um, and if you read the paper, basically what happened was these were people who were in dating couples. Uh, it was only one person from the couple, I believe, in this study. And they were put into a situation where they had to listen to like a conversation that was designed to make them angry or upset. So like the context of the conversation, I think, was they're overhearing a conversation of like their partner not only cheating on them, but like making fun of them about it, like throwing shade about the cheating, so like to elevate the situation. And they were assigned one of three strategies to help them not get mad about this. No strategy, cognitive reappraisal or suppression, which is like just stuff it down and try not to be mad about it, I think. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> a comment from the Zoomers, cognitive reappraisal is check yourself before you wreck yourself. Mm. I like that. That makes sense to me. Yeah, so suppression, pretend it's not a problem. You can reappraise it or do nothing. And so this was a manipulation where they assigned people to three groups. And the other factor of the design was whether or not this person had a history of perpetuating, perpetrating intimate partner violence. So some sort of dysfunctional something in their relationship. So it was like a two by three kind of design. Both dimensions are between the subjects. So this is a cross-sectional analysis. And as you know, one does in psychology, ANOVA is the bread and butter of psychology experiments. She was going to do this two-way between groups ANOVA for the three levels of condition by two levels of IPB to see basically if cognitive reappraisal benefited people with a history of violence more, I think was sort of the directional hypothesis. I could be wrong about that, but I think that's what I remember. And I will foreshadow the reason why I believe I had this conversation with the student in the first place. The interaction term that she cares deeply about had a p-value of 0.06 from the ANOVA. So the lead author came to me with a picture that looked like this. This is the distribution of her outcome which is the number of aggressive verbalizations the subject said during the session, otherwise known as mean things to say. And the words that I would use to describe this outcome is zero inflated. So that is a term. That's, I didn't make that up. That's a common term. Like 45% of the sample did not say anything mean. And all the way up to like somebody said 22 or 24 mean things over here. So this is a count distribution because there's no way that you can say negative mean things. They didn't count like nice things as negative, aggressive, or something. But this is not going to work with an ANOVA. So the question that I was asked initially is what kind of data transformation is going to fix this and make it look normal? I'm like, uh, no. Like there, there's nothing I can do that's going to take this constant right here and turn it into anything other than another pile at a different point. Um, I could potentially like take a log or something that would reel in this tail, but really the big problem is right here. Any kind of slope that is going to predict this outcome has to understand that you can't have fewer than zero aggressive verbalizations. Like that's as low as the scale can go. So one thing to keep in mind is that assumption distributions about our outcomes are never about the original outcome. Looking at a histogram like this can only tell you so much. What the assumptions are about are the residuals. So what I should be looking at really is a picture like this, which breaks down the distribution by group to look at what basically the E's would look like. So these E's, also decidedly not normal, and more to the point, certain combinations appear to have a lot more variability than other combinations. So not only not normal, but not constant. And the not constant is the bigger issue here, because any pairwise comparisons that I would make across these groups are either going to have, if it's one standard error that's supposed to be constant, it's going to be too big in some cases and too little in other cases, and it's not going to work. So at the time, I was 
teaching a class on this type of material for the first time, and I didn't have an example, and I'm like, can I have your data? So we went through this whole thing, and we ended up with a count model that ended up with very different conclusions. And so that's the story that I want to show you. It's a story that has a happy ending because her thesis eventually did get published. All right, so we're going to be looking at first a normal model for the sake of comparison, like what if I just did an ANOVA, like normal, then four different types of count models, two of which we talked about last week, Poisson and negative binomial to start with. I'm guessing that's all the further we'll get today. And then two more that add on the idea of zero inflation. The way that zero inflation is added on is as another submodel. So that concept occurs across many different types of generalized models. You can have two different submodels that work together to create an outcome in zero inflated cases. In terms of software, unfortunately, basically every choice is a different function within Stata or within R. So there's not really one package that will do all of the count models at the same time. So we're, I'm using a different number of packages than usual to pull this off. Uh, I have full results, syntax and output for SAS in the download folder if you want to use SAS for these models. I'm using Stata and R for purposes of demonstration in this class. The original data are not in the download folder though because they're not mine, they're hers. And I don't have permission to share them. Okay. Any questions on the setup thus far? All right, so a minimal amount of data manipulation needed to get things going as usual. I converted the data into Excel so that I could import it into Stata or R in the same way. First thing that I had to do is ER condition is my categorical variable. This is whether the person was assigned to none, cognitive reappraisal or suppression. And I am going to create two dummy codes to differentiate these three groups. One is going to be called NVC, which to me stands for none versus cognitive. I'm also creating N versus S, which is none versus suppression. So you can name your variables whatever you'd like. The more letters you name using the name, though, the longer your typing is whenever you have to fit a model. So keep that in, keep that in mind. I could have let the program denote this as categorical, but that works less transparently than just writing out the terms that you want in your model. So I prefer to do it sort of manually so that everything corresponds to a linear model representation. So these are going to be my two predictors to differentiate my three manipulated conditions. IPV was already in the data set. That's a dummy code for no history of IPV. One is yes history. And those are the two predictors or two variables that are going to be used in the model as predictors. Uh, just as a reminder that if you had any cases that are missing on anything that goes into the model, those cases will be dropped. So I'm doing that ahead of time to keep the sample consistent across all of the analysis. In R, same process, reading in Excel data, saving it as a data frame just in case it didn't come in that way. And then here's the dummy coding process in R where I have N versus C set to zero if it's condition one. N versus C turns on to 1 if it's the cognitive condition, and N versus S turns on to 1 if it's the suppression condition. And then complete cases filtering for the same reason in R as well. Okay. Questions on the setup? All stuff you've seen before. But I like to remind folks that this is a part of the analysis. Getting the data ready to analyze can take a surprisingly long time. Then how did I make the pictures? So the pictures that I just showed you down here, these came from Stata. So I have um, condition means and descriptives, and then I had histograms, and by that, I had made, figured out a way to make an overall histogram in R, but I couldn't figure out a way to make it for cell, and so I gave up. So if anyone wants to help me with that, please do. Here is the end result of what's going to happen. Okay, I'm telling you the end of the story before we even get through it. Here are the number of people in each of these conditions. Note that it's uneven because of the IPV variable. That wasn't manipulated. So there are fewer people who have a history of interpersonal violence, interpartner violence, whatever that stands for, than people who don't. The max column, this is the maximum count observed 
across these six categories. So the condition in which they were assigned to the control group and did not have a history of violence actually was the highest. Somebody said 24 mean things in there, whereas the condition of cognitive reappraisal for people who did have a history of violence, the maximum was one. So zeros are ones only in that. So that translates into very different standard deviations across the conditions. In the raw data, these are the means. So I did this color coding in Excel to help the differences become a little bit more salient. So the greener it is, the higher the mean, and the redder it is, the higher the standard error. So standard errors are a function of the standard deviation per condition as well as the sample size. Then we have what's going to happen as I fit three different types of models here using an ANOVA with a normal distribution and, and no link function versus a Poisson and a negative binomial. Do you remember what their link function is for counts? No. It's the natural log is the link that we're going to be using. The log link creates a boundary that shuts off the prediction at zero. So it keeps the predicted counts positive, but it goes up into positive infinity. So it's a one boundary, one sided link. After I back translate, so if I have log count is what the model is predicting directly, and I want to get back to expected count, then I take E to the model prediction, and then it's I'm in expected count. What do I call back translate if I'm writing it in a paper? Inverse, Inverse link function, yes. Uh, unlog it is not going to fly in the paper either, but that's what I think of it in my head. E to the log, basically, if you unlog it. Now I want you to look at the green and yellow columns here. Do you see anything in common across the four of them? The means, the means are the same. Yeah, these models are all equally good at figuring out what the mean should be for each of my conditions. They differ in what they say the standard error for that mean is. So in the normal distribution, the standard errors are a lot more the same because the only thing that's making them different is the sample size for that condition. They're all based on the same constant amount of residual variance. Whereas Poisson and negative binomial, the standard error is proportional to the mean. The conditions with the highest means have the highest standard errors. But if I compare the latter two, Poisson versus negative binomial, what's the difference here? One's bigger. Coincidence or consequence? Consequence, always, yes. Negative binomial is the distribution that takes Poisson and like stretches it out with this k-stretchy factor. So the pictures that went along with that Here's a picture of different Poisson distributions where there's only one parameter. The mean is the variance in these distributions. So if I say the mean is one, the variance is one, and that's the yellow line. Mean variance four is the purple line, and mean variance 10 is the blue line. So the Poisson has some degree of skewness to it if the predicted count is very close to zero, but the further off zero you get, the more symmetric it looks. But it is a discrete distribution as indicated by the dots here, meaning that it understands you can't have like a count of one and a half. It understands these have to be whole numbers. Negative binomial is an add-on to the Poisson that adds a multiplier. I call it K in the notation. It's called a dispersion parameter or a scale parameter in your output that we'll see. And it allows the variance to grow as a quadratic function of the mean. So the higher the predicted count, the more variance is expected around it in a quadratic accelerating kind of fashion. So these pictures that I made then, red versus blue is the same mean of five, but the red one is the negative binomial stretchy factor added in so that there's more of a tail. Same thing with blue versus green. They both have a mean of 10, but purple, or I don't know my colors, green versus purple, there we go. Green versus purple both have a mean of 10, whereas purple has a stretchy that, that brings the tail out here. So this k right here, what happens if k is estimated as basically zero? 
And then this whole part goes away. We're back to Poisson. Said differently, Poisson is nested in negative binomial because whether or not you need a stretchy that differs from zero is an empirical question. Otherwise known as a dispersion or scale parameter. But I like stretchy because that's what it does. It makes it stretchy. So the negative binomial over here has a lot higher standard errors, but they still have the same pattern in that the higher the mean, the higher the standard error goes around it. The higher the count, the easier it is to be wrong. Like there's more room to be wrong at a high count than there is at a low count. So our question would be basically, how do I pick between these two? Poisson and negative binomial are nested. Poisson is nested in negative binomial, but normal is different. So I can do a model comparison to talk about these two, but I can't do a model comparison to talk about normal. The formula for height is on a different scale in normal than it is in these ones. But I can show you some indications that normal is probably not going to be viable. Okay, with me so far. All right, so let's do what she did. Actually, let me go over the linear predictor and then we'll do what she did. So every single model in this handout is the same with respect to the linear predictor. There's no empty models, there's no extra stuff. So that's why I have agar, aggressive verbalizations with a hat on it, because there's no error term type thing in here. This is just describing how the predicted counts get assembled out of the differences between groups and the differences as a function of IPV. So I've got an intercept here, and it is an intercept. It's not a threshold. What's an intercept again? And don't think too hard. You know this one. Uh, no, yep. You're thinking too hard. Expected outcome when the predictors are zero, right? But the only catch, what do I have to stick in front of expected outcome for this to work, given the link function? Yeah, so it's either identity, if it's a, if it's a general linear model has an identity link, meaning times one, or in count data, it's logs, not logits this time. Logit is for two boundaries, logs is for one boundary, a lower boundary. So it's the expected log of the count when all the predictors are zero. We just gotta stick the word log in there. Likewise, each of these slopes is the change in the log count for a one unit change in each of these variables. The way that I have this coded, IPV is zero or one, and each of these is zero or one. So beta zero is gonna be my expected log count for someone without a history of violence who got assigned to the none condition. Beta one is the, what I would call the simple main effect of interpersonal violence, specifically for, given the coding, who is this for? What kind of person? Control group. The control group, the none group, because that's when these interaction terms drop out. Likewise, beta 3 and beta 2 tell me about none versus cognitive reappraisal and none versus suppression, specifically in what kind of person? Given these interaction terms, beta 2 and beta 3 are for what level of their moderator? Uh, yep, zero for IPV. Yep. So for someone without a history, these interaction terms would drop because they'd zero out, and all we'd have is this. The interaction terms then, they do not tell us what happened in the IPV1 group. They tell us how the em emotion regulation manipulation effects differed across IPV groups. So to get to what it would be in any group, we got to add them together. So I have the model implied slopes then. Three-step process. If I want the IPV slope, step one, 
Go into the equation, find all the things that have IPV. Step two, bring it down and factor out the variable the slope is for. Step three is your result. So the slope of IPV to describe differences in aggressive verbalizations between people without a history of violence, relative, or with relative to without, starts out with the main effect, and then the interaction terms turn on if they're in one of these alternative groups. I can go the other way and talk about the group differences with IPV as the moderator, which is the way they had thought about it. So none versus cognitive starts off with its main effect plus the moderation of IPV. Same thing with this one. And the two that I need, the alternative groups, if I want to compare those, that's another linear combination. So all of this logic of what these slopes mean does not care if we have a normal distribution of Poisson, a negative binomial, or whatever. The linear predictor works the same because it's going to be predicting whatever y is at a given moment, either regular y to start with or count y to finish with. Okay, questions on any of that? Then I'm going to show you some stuff. I'm using a different function to fit an ANOVA than usual. I am using in Stata a function called GLM, which stands for Generalized Linear Model, which is a generic function that has a bunch of different options for different generalized models. The reason that I'm using this is because it's going to eventually tell us about distribution fit, and it also tells us exactly what the model is with respect to how the mean and variance are related to each other. I'm using maximum likelihood estimation so that I can keep that constant across all of the results. So if you think about the idea of an ANOVA, otherwise known as a general linear model predicting a continuous outcome with categorical predictors, which is the way I would talk about an ANOVA. We have that specified as a generalized model if we say we're using an identity link, which means what? What's an identity link? Times one, meaning don't, don't leave, just leave it alone. And family Gaussian, any guesses as to what that is? Normal distribution for the, for the conditional distribution. Gaussian is, means normal. So it's telling you down here then that you've made those choices in the output, which is always helpful. So the regular output is down here. It looks the same as it would in ANOVA. The extra pieces that, uh, that I get by using this GLM package are up here. This thing right here is an index of distribution fit if you're in a generalized model, but not if you're in a normal model. What this number actually is, is the residual variance. This is your mean square error. That was the part that I screwed up the first time I taught this class. So I'm fixing it now. So this number is our residual variance. That's what it's telling you here. I've got my fixed effect coefficients here. We're going to interpret those in just a minute. We'll do that on the R side once we get the simple slopes. I asked for minus 2 log likelihood because Stata gives you log likelihood. And log likelihood times minus 2 is what goes into likelihood ratio test. That's why we report it that way. Um, if this were an ANOVA, do you see anything right here that tells me if my model is significant? the way that I would normally have an f-test for my model r-square. Do you see anything that looks like it would be some kind of global significance test for my model? Nope. So if I want one, what do I do? Ask for it. So we're making use of multivariate Wald tests which is something we introduce in the first unit as a review of general linear models. Rather than having Fs, though, these are chi-squares. But the idea is that we can ask the software to lump together as many slopes as we want and to get a joint significance test of whether they're all equal to zero. So the test of the model 
would be accomplished in Stata by listing every single slope, including the interaction terms. So the degrees of freedom for this test is 5, because that's how many slopes I've lumped together. Chi-square is 27, which results in a p-value of less than 0 0.0001. So yes, I would say this means I have a significant model. Our square for the model is trickier. We'll get to that in, like, probably Thursday. I'll show you how to get one of those. We have to go about it a different way because there's no residual variance in the count models. The thing that the student cared about, though, was the test of the interaction. So in this model, the idea of whether emotion regulation condition matters more for people with a history of violence, that idea requires two slopes to be put together, which in ANOVA terms would be the omnibus interaction. So I can lump just those two together. I get a chi-square of 5.7 and a p-value of 0.06. Here's what I would get in ANOVA, by the way. I ran that separately just to have a point of comparison. A couple differences. What's this number right here? If you see an F result look like that, what's the second term after the, the comma? Sample size minus fixed effect? Yep, this is denominator degrees of freedom. Okay. This is the number of slopes I could still add to the model because I have 225 people. Do you see anything that looks like that number over here in my output for these chi squares? No. Coincidence or consequence? Consequence. Yeah. Chi square doesn't use denominator degrees of freedom. The other thing that looks different is that this F is smaller than this chi square. But if you take F times the number of slopes, that is your chi-square. So you can get from one test result back to the other. The difference would be the p-value and whether the p-value adjusts the area under the distribution for the sample size and the denominator degrees of freedom. So point being, the chi-square is not the reason why the result was not significant. It was also not significant in ANOVA land, too. Chi-square would be actually optimistic relative to F. So then all the work that one would have to do to figure out what the interaction might be telling us. I used margins to ask for condition means for the six cells of my design. I used LINCOM to ask for simple slopes. So the effective IPV per condition, where the first one is given to me by the model because that's for none. Then I have IPV slope plus the interaction term to get to what it would be in each of the other conditions. Simple slopes for condition within each IPV group. So when IPV is no, I have the differences as a function of the dummy codes for group, and then the interaction terms are off because IPV is no, whereas the interaction terms turn on with a 1 when IPV is yes. Then last but not least, interaction contrasts, because there's three different interactions implied by the two interaction slopes. The first two are already in my model, but they're included for reference. The third one is the one that I have to ask for as a combination of one minus the other. So we'll walk through the numbers when I get to the uh, uh, R output, in which all of these are tabled nicely. Stata output is like 18 pages of these things, and I haven't figured out how to stack them all into one table. If anyone knows how to do that out there on YouTube, please tell me. I don't know how to work with Stata output very much. I haven't really learned to do that. so. R, though, stacks it all nicely together. So here's the same analysis using GLM and R. Note that we have this specifying that this is a normal conditional distribution with an identity link. Formula looks the same as usual. The output, though, says dispersion parameter for Gaussian family taken to be 11.6. That's R4. Yeah, this is your residual variance. Same results with respect to minus 2 log likelihood and the two chi-squares for the test of the overall model versus the interaction term. Um, 
Let's try to walk through the coefficient, shall we? It's 258. This is something you already know how to do. I'm taking pity on you, even though I'm contractually obligated to keep talking. The intercept. So this is pretending that it's not a count. The expected count is 2.7 mean things for what kind of person? Yeah, no history of IPV. And who is assigned to which group? Yeah, the none group, the control group, the end group, we'll call it. Cool. Okay. If I have a history of IPV, what happens to my predicted number of mean things said? Coefficient is 0.33, p-value is 0.71. Yep, if I have a history of IPV, my predicted mean things goes up by 0.33, but that's non-significant. Is that the end of my sentence? No, it is not. What's the end of my sentence? For someone in the none group, because that's the only situation in which these terms would drop out and the slope is just the 0.33. So if we start with this idea of history of violence is related to slightly higher counts, what happens to that pattern in the the cognitive reappraisal group instead. I'll accept two different answers for this one. Your choices are more positive, less positive, more negative, or less negative. We got one vote for less positive because this is a positive slope and a negative interaction. But what other answer do you think would be a reasonable one? Yeah, more negative, right? Because this is not just taking away, it's heading away from zero in the opposite direction. So it looks like that tendency is reversed to some extent in the other group. This is the difference between the groups and the slope of IPV. To get to what it would be in the C group, I have to add these two numbers together. That's what I need a LINCOM for. Likewise, what does being in the suppression group due to my IPV slope. Yes, I'm watching the chat, Zoomers. Thank you for participating as well. Got to vote for more positive. And not significantly, but more positive. Is 1.77 the IPV slope in the suppression group? No. No, it is not. What is it? Yeah, it's the difference. To get to what the IPV slope would be in the suppression group, I got to add those two numbers together. That's a linear combination. Now, so far, it looks like there's nothing much to do with these interactions here, right? But the p-value was 0.06. Question? Yeah, I was sorry. Which two numbers did you need to add again? Like, what are the linear? What would be the linear combination? The effective IPV in the none group plus how the effect of IPV differs in the S group gets you to what it is in the S group. Yep. That's the thing is that a lot of people, when they look at these, they want to say, well, this is the slope in the alternative group. It is not. It is how the slope differs in the alternative group. To get to what the slope is in the alternative group, we have to add it to the original slope. So my question was, how did I get a two-slope interaction with the p-value of 0.06 when neither of these is anywhere near 0.06? That strike you as odd? Am I overlooking something, potentially? What do you think? Nope, it's, it's all internally either using, um, in R it's going to be T's and F's potentially if I use denominator degrees of freedom. I asked it for chi-squares, so it would be the same output. Um, but otherwise, the sample size is such that like these p-values would be basically the same if this were T's versus Z's. 
how many different comparisons would be of interest here if I have three groups? If I want to talk about the IPV slope and how it differs across my three groups, how many pairwise differences are there? None versus cognitive, none versus suppression. I need to raise another finger. What am I forgetting? Yeah, the two alternative groups, C versus S. Now look at how different their coefficients are. C versus S would be the difference between these two numbers. That's going to be a fairly big result. So it looks like that's where the story is. C versus S is where the interaction is coming from. So these are only two out of the three possible interaction contrasts. The idea that this is a this is describing like a two by two sort of situation where we're actually in a two by three. So what if I wanted to know how the IPV slope differs between cognitive and suppression? It would be this one minus that one, linear combination. So only this table only has part of the story, but it has enough ingredients that we can compute our way to the full story as linear combinations of these fixed effects. And as several of you found out, I think, the hard way in working on the golf homework, it's difficult when you have one table with part of the information and then you have like six other tables with the other pieces of the information. So to make it easier in the long run, I write out all the things, even if I have some of them already, so that everything is in one spot in my output. So here's all the things that I might want to know, starting with what are my cell means. So I'm using the prediction function, which is equivalent to margins and stata. And I'm doing three of them so that I don't have to cut out rows that don't matter. So I'm going over IPV and holding constant group as the none group in the first line, the, the cognitive group in the second, and the suppression group in the third. Here's my cell means. I have a note here in bold, uh-oh. Any guesses as to why I marked this one uh-oh? This is the cell mean for the group that has a history of IPV and it was in the cognitive appraisal condition. Anything strike you as odd there? The confidence not of course, the interval. Yeah, the confidence interval overlaps zero for a mean. So the cell mean of number of mean things you would say is somewhere between negative one number of mean things you would say and 1.6. That doesn't make a lot of sense. So I don't need a significance test or a distribution fit statistic to tell me uh, this probably isn't going to work for this analysis. The confidence width shouldn't be based on the same standard error for all of these things, or based on the same residual variance contributing to the standard error that varies only by sample size. But having a picture of the means will help us figure out what the interaction term is happening. So let me see if I can get this all to fit on one slide here. One, one second, almost. There we go. So the first three lines in these general linear hypothesis tests, GLHT commands, are getting the simple slope differences with respect to IPV per group. In English, on my plot, the difference between the two lines here, here, and here. That's what I'm asking for. So red versus blue in the control condition is the only one I have already out of the model. Red versus blue in cognitive and in suppression, I got to ask for. The way that I get them is I start with red versus blue in the none. I add to it the interaction term that moves me down to the right spot. So down here or over here. So that shows up as the first one is for the IPV slope main effect and then systematically turning it on for the alternative groups via the ones in the interaction terms. So eyeballing this, we found that the IPV effect was non-significant here. Do you think it'll be significant here? 
Maybe. We'll find out. Then the group differences. First for IPV equals no for the blue line. The difference between none, cognitive, and suppression. Three differences. Then we got differences for the red lines. And then last but not least, the interaction terms visually are going to tell us is the difference for none between red and blue different than the difference between red and blue for cognitive. Interaction terms are differences of differences. So is the gap between red and blue the same for none as it is for cognitive? That's the interaction term. The gap. Is the gap between red and blue in none the same as the gap between red and blue in suppression? That's another interaction. Those are the two that we have in the model. The third one that we were missing is, is the gap between red and blue for cognitive different than the gap between red and blue for suppression? That one looks like a bigger difference to me. Another way to say it is the difference in the slopes. So the slope describes the effect of group. So it looks like based on number of mean things that cognitive reappraisal is best. The people said the fewest mean things in that condition. Leaving them alone resulted in somewhat of an intermediate possibility, but then the suppression group is where it gets interesting. So this looks like the biggest effect of the manipulation, but it depends on where their history was. So the last interaction contrast is looking at the gap between the lines for cognitive versus the gap between the lines for suppression, or alternatively, the difference in the slopes between this spot and this one. So then here are the results. It looks like if you have, if you're on the, let's see, suppression one, this difference is significant, but it's not significant here or here. If we do the group differences in the, in the no group, which is the blue line, then it looks like none and cognitive reappraisal are different. Cognitive reappraisal and, and suppression are different, but none and suppression are the same. So that matches our picture here. This blue point is basically the same as that blue point. Then when we go into the yes group, that is the red line. None and suppression are not different, but the others are for the red line. So these two are not different, according to the model, but this one is lower than both. And then the differences of the differences, lo and behold, the third interaction contrast, the one that we had to ask for because it wasn't given directly, that's the one that has a significant p-value. So the lumping together of slopes Basically, you can lump together like these two, or you can lump together these two, and the third is a linear combination, and it knows that. So that omnibus test covers all three possibilities at the same. 311, we're almost done for the day. Let me show you some pictures. These are pictures from SAS, but you can make these kind of pictures in any package. These are distri distributions of the residuals. And it has a little normal curve overlaid. Does that look normal to you? No, here's my pile of people that they're still in here. Uh, here's another way of saying, does this look normal to you? It does not. If it were, then this line and the dots would align. But another problem, this picture right here, what do you think about the spread of the residuals around the predicted count, the linear predictor? Does it look like it's equal or even? Not at all, right? There's a lot less error the lower the predictor is, and the error gets sort of bigger as you move up. So this is non-constant variance. This is heteroscedasticity, which is a bigger problem than normality in this context where we're interested in group comparisons. So coming up with one average amount of residual variance is going to be too small for some of the cases and too big for the others. So we got to fix that. The Poisson distribution, is that a constant variance distribution or not constant? I'll 
put the picture back up from Wikipedia. Does this say that the variance is constant or it's not constant? It's not obvious. It looks like it would be constant because it's the mean and the variance are the same. But this is from what would essentially be an empty model where there's only one mean. So if some people have a predicted count of three and some people have a predicted count of two and some people have a predicted count of one, this model is actually saying the variance is going to change with that predicted count. The variance at two is two. The variance at three is three. The variance at four is four. So it's actually a non-constant. This is a heterogeneous variance model in disguise. So it's not just the normal part, it's the constant variance part is being addressed simultaneously by picking a distribution that builds in not constant variance of the kind that we want. Now the question is, is this good enough? Or should we have more variance than what the mean predicts? The answer is going to be more, but I'll show you how to get to that next time. You'll have to stay tuned for the exciting conclusion of does negative binomial fit better than Poisson? which no one ever woke up in the morning and asked that question, right? No one's thesis was directed at that question. But in order for Rosie to figure out if her manipulation worked the way that she thought it would, we got to have standard errors we can trust, and the standard errors come from the distribution. So that's why we care. As I showed you on the first page of this, the cell means are going to be the same either way. It's the error around them that we're focused on. Okay, 315, that means I am no longer contractually obligated to talk anymore. Any questions before we call it a day? Yes? So, so the question was, like, if I have a count, would I look at these sorts of residual plots? So... If you ask that question to a statistician, they would say absolutely, and if you asked it to me, I would say no, because people are really bad at finding patterns in these kinds of plots. Like, I did this for pedagogical because this was one case in which it was kind of obvious, but in practice, it can be very hard to look at a picture and to understand whether you're viewing something that's incorrect. Whenever possible, I would try to phrase it as an empirical question via some kind of fit index or nested model comparison or something. In practice, yes, but it, people are not, I'm not good enough to, obvi to see when there's a problem necessarily, unless it's so egregious that there's no other choice. You, so you could make, there are tests for normality of residuals. Um, they tend not to work super well, and they tend to be um, subject to sample size. I think the question would be, like, if you think about the sample space of your outcome, like what possible values could a count be, and does that make sense that it would be continuous and symmetric? Because that's what normal says. And does it make sense that it would have constant variance? And it doesn't in this context. So the fact that descriptive statistics, so marginally, is, as I'm saying, the, before you predict anything, like a picture like this will point you in a direction. Like, this suggests that normal is probably not going to work. But it's not going to tell you which exact, like, choice. It will point you towards a family. But, yeah, to narrow it down, we need tests or we need, you know, more fine-grained analysis like something like this. Okay. Thanks for being here, folks. I will hope to see everyone on Thursday. Let me know if you need anything in the meantime. I'm going to go have some birthday cake with my kids.